Good, ev good evening, everyone. It is a joy to be here. I'm enjoying my time since January very, very much, and it's a great honor to be a part of an organization that uh, represents and works on behalf of a president as wonderful as President Ford. And uh, I'm really enjoying my time uh, being here in the Grand Rapids community as well as uh, in the Ann Arbor community. So I'm, I'm the only presidential library director in the country who has the opportunity to be in two sites 130 miles apart. And uh, a, a new slogan, not yet on a t-shirt, but we might yet, is the power of two. Or if you've seen one, you haven't seen it all. <laughs> so think, of, think about that. So it's a pleasure to welcome you, and of course, uh, we totally planned the lovely spring weather, you know, all of that, and, and we thank our master gardener sincerely for the beautiful flowers outside. That's, that's really wonderful. I want to share with you, uh, along the lines Marty did, that uh, President Ford called to welcome me on my first day on the job, and it's not every job you would take in a lifetime where a president calls to welcome you. And just a few weeks, my husband Gordon and I flew out to meet with the president, and we spent more than an hour with him, and he looks well, feels well, is sharp as a tack, and just a wonderful person. And uh, since I've mentioned my husband, I'll embarrass him and say, my husband Gordon, please stand. He's the other part of the team. Since many of you are friends of Ford, I'm sure you know about the wonderful traditions here in Grand Rapids on the President's birthday. Uh, I've been invited to address the Grand Rapids uh, Rotary Club on his birthday, and uh, we'll also be having cake here at the museum, so I hope you'll put that on your calendars. July 14th, it may be Bastille Day, but it's President Ford's birthday. <laughs> so we have our priorities straight here. I also want to mention one thing about uh, exhibits going on on the library side. As you know, the prime activity for speakers and events like this and for exhibitions is this facility, which was designed for that purpose. But over in Ann Arbor on the University of Michigan, cam Michigan campus, we will also be doing uh, some exhibits and programs in tandem with what's happening here and sometimes separately. Uh, this summer here at the museum, after we close the Churchill and the Bob Hope shows that are going on right now, we'll be opening a sports exhibit that will be really spectacular. But I also want to ask you to put on your calendars a, a, an exhibit over in, in uh, Ann Arbor. It's called Play Ball, Mr. President, and you can imagine what that's all about. Uh, it will be a photo exhibit featuring presidents uh, from all periods of time. It's 75 photographs and a variety of historical documents, and we'll be having some programs as well. So if you're having fun tonight, mark your calendars uh, for uh, opening on May 31st, and sometime soon after that there will be an opening reception. And we'd love to see some of our Grand Rapids neighbors coming to the east side of the state. And we've got some Ann Arbor people here tonight, so uh, we, we hope to do more of that. Today we celebrate the opening of Churchill and the Great Republic, and if you haven't gotten upstairs to see it yet, we hope you will linger after this, uh, this presentation. The timing for this exhibit and the adjacent one featuring memorabilia from Bob Hope is most fortuitous because this coming May 8th, Mother's Day, marks the 60th anniversary of VE Day. This exhibit comes to us from the Library of Congress as a result of Congressman Ehler's efforts and his leadership as past chair of the Joint Committee on the Library of Congress. And indeed, we are very much in his debt for his, uh, shall we say, friendly and positive influence on, on our behalf. As Marty mentioned, we have also received support from the Steelcase Foundation and also the staff of the Hauenstein Center for Presidential Studies at Grand Valley State University. And uh, Susan Broman from the foundation was not able to be here tonight, but Gleaves Whitney, the head of the Howenstein Center, is here. Gleaves, there you are. Okay. Uh, we'll, we're partnering with them on a number of things. <laughs> to put on an exhibit like this, uh, it, let's just say it does not just happen. Uh, a few weeks ago, there was a takedown, I don't want to say teardown, takedown of the China exhibit. And then the staff went into a flurry of activity to uh, move panels, put up the right configuration for this one. And I want to give credit to the staff people who really made this happen. Jim Kratzis and Don Holloway were the people responsible for arranging for the exhibit and designing. Batima Demitz and Jamie Draper hung the display, which is a real work of art. And Barb Packer and Kristen Moody coordinated invitations for tonight, marketing, and this reception. And I would ask your support in thanking all of them for their efforts.
Finally, there are three other individuals I'd like to introduce as special guests tonight. The first is someone well known in this community, and that's Betsy DeVos. She's a leader in the community and in our state. She is also a new member of the Library of Congress Trust Fund Board. Betsy? It's right there. Cool. We also have with us Beth Fitzsimmons, who was chair of the National Commission on Libraries and Information Science, which is a, a federal agency, and she has come from Ann Arbor with her husband, Joe Fitzsimmons, to be with us. Beth and Joe. And the third person I haven't met yet because in the crowd I couldn't quite find him, but he is Gary Benign, who was the president of the Detroit area chapter of the Churchill Center, an international organization of Churchill historians, scholars, and enthusiasts. Gary, where are you? Please, there he is. Wonderful. Their group is going to be arranging probably a weekend a special visit here. So uh, we were very pleased to be contacted, and I believe there was information out front with regard to the Churchill Center, if you're a fan as, as I am. Now, Marty has done such a wonderful introduction of Congressman Ehlers that it's hard to, to add, but it's to me very meaningful that Congressman Ehlers has represented this area and indeed West Michigan and been a very strong active uh, representative first in uh, here at Calvin College and then of course in his uh, service in the Michigan legislature and now since 1993 in Washington. He has been a wonderful support and of and friend to this museum, has been a staunch advocate for the community and we are really, really grateful, sir, for your leadership and your support, not just on behalf of this exhibit but everything you do. Congressman Ehlers. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here with you this evening. And you've had lots of introductions already, but I have to introduce two more dignitaries in addition to the main one I'm supposed to introduce. Uh, first of all, of course, my wife, Jo, is with me. <laughs> and also someone I have a great deal of respect for who survived in the political arena for a long time, Joanne Emmons, sitting in the front row accompanied by her husband and her daughter. Uh, thank good to see you again, Joanne. You're in for a great treat. That's a marvelous exhibit, and uh, I'm sure you'll all enjoy seeing it and probably want to come back and see it again. Churchill, of course, was one of the great human beings of this past century, and uh, it's just a real pleasure to be of sm some small assistance in bringing that exhibit here. Uh, it was, um, I serve on a lot of different committees, but I have to say the one that was the most fun is the Joint Committee in the Library of Congress. And I'll, in a minute I'll tell you how I ended up there. But uh, it's a fun committee to be on because it always is affiliated with fun things, good things to do, uh, whether they're educational or literary or whatever. And particularly I remember the opening of the Churchill exhibit. Uh, they're usually opened with a, a quick run through and uh, a nice dinner. And I rarely have time to go to those dinners, but this one I went to and uh, was privileged to sit at the same table as Lady Soyam, who is uh, Winston Churchill's last surviving child. And it was fascinating to sit with her and talk and reminisce about, about uh, some of the great events that happened, oh, more than 50 years ago now. But how did, uh, I said I was going to say how I ended up in that committee. It's. Uh, it all goes back to the county commission and John Brewer. Now some of the old timers here will remember John Brewer. Really tough, crusty old guy. When I was elected to the county commission, John was the real power there. He had stepped down as chairman, but he was still the power behind the throne. And he came to me a few weeks after I was on the commission and he said, Vern, I would like to have you go on the county library board. I said, John, I just can't do it. I work a full time job and I'm on enough committees already, I, I just can't do it. So he walked away. A few weeks later, he came back. He said, Vern, the library is just in a real mess, and we need someone who understands that and who can help straighten it out. You just have to go on the library board. I said, John, I'm sorry. I can't take on any more assignments. This, I just have to say no. Two weeks later, he comes back again. 
He says, Vern, I checked around with all the other county commissioners, and I found that you're the only one who knows how to read. You have to take that job. <laughs> <laughs> and how, how do you say no then? <laughs> but when I got on that board, then Don Souter, who was in the audience here and was very, very active in the city library board, said, Vern, we've got to get the city and the county libraries to work together. I want you to go on the city board, too. <laughs> so he engineered my appointment. Out of that came the Lakeland uh, Federation. And when I got to the, to the state legislature, I ended up serving on the state, uh, the board of the State Library of Michigan. So I guess it was for preordained that I would end up on the Joint Committee Governing the Library of Congress. The, um, the irony of that is when my appointment was announced, I was talking to uh, another member of Congress on the floor, and he congratulated me on that appointment. He happened to be Catholic, by the way. He congratulated me on that appointment. I said, well, I guess this is going to be the end of the road for me. He says, I don't know. I might be able to get you on the Vatican Library Board. <laughs> At any rate, enough of the history. You're more interested in the real history that you came here to learn about. And it's my pleasure to introduce the main attraction of the evening, a good friend of mine, Dr. James Billington, who is the Librarian of Congress, without doubt the best job in Washington, D.C., for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's, it's a great job to have. Secondly, you don't have to run for election to get it. Thirdly, it's not term limited. So I... Uh, <laughs> I congratulate you, Jim. And Jim has done a great job. He is a, an historian, has a PhD in history, and uh, his real love is Russia. He is making, makes several trips to Russia every year, and every once, every once in a while when he needs a hand, I'll get a call. One day he had a group of Russian clerics in his office and said, Vern, could you run over here? I, I need uh, a good Christian from America to talk to these people. <laughs> And so I uh, rushed over there and had a very enjoyable meeting with uh, the clerics. But he's uh, all around, if, if you understand the meaning of the term Renaissance man, you are about to hear from one, Dr. James Billington. Thank you very much, Mr. Raylers. He's really, um, I don't want you to think we spend all our time scratching each other's back, but I have to, I do have to tell you that, um, uh, first of all, the Joint Committee on the Library of Congress is the oldest Joint Committee of the Congress. It was founded almost in 1802, just two years after the, um, the Congress opened business in Washington, D.C., and um, uh, Chairman Ehlers has really been a, a powerful leader in a lot of respects, including since one of the great events at the Library of Congress in recent years has been the onset of a national digital library, which we call American Memory, which has about 10 million items of American history and culture available online free. That um, I don't think we would have gotten into that, certainly not as soon, without his encouragement and also his knowledge. He's one of the very few uh, people with a doctorate in physics or in any um, high scientific uh, discipline who understood early the importance, educational importance, um, of uh, the development of the internet and the ability to project things so that the fact that the, so much of the Library of Congress is, uh, is online and is crafted for distinctively for the K through 12 educational um, problem in our country to try to turn this, uh, this often menacing um, uh, new technological toy into something that's created for education is something we also owe, owe to, um, to Mr. Ehlers. So I just wanted you all to know that he's, he's doing something not only for, for this district, but for the Congress itself with his many committees and services, but um, has helped us in what is maybe one of the more important things that the Library of Congress has been able to do for the nation. Uh, I'm very happy to be here for the opening of this uh, Churchill exhibit, uh, partly because, although some people say we live in an age without heroes or individual heroes, and many people in my profession, the historical profession, um, seem devoted to the proposition, or at least uh, 
have played with it for an awfully long time, that individuals don't really matter, that it's either great impersonal social forces on the one hand or um, deep glandular uh, problems on the other hand that, that uh, determine the of history, the importance of individual leaders and moral actors on the world stage as we can think of the passing of the Pope recently. Um, there is a, a thirst for leadership. There is a thirst for people who are able to move people and particularly moving people in the right direction and certainly Churchill was of that category. Uh, and we're glad that, and I'm personally glad and we're institutionally happy to have it here at the Ford Museum. Um, I, I, I was, ran another organization in Washington, the Woodrow Wilson Center before the Library of Congress, so I was there during the Ford administration and uh, was witness to what you all know and what's beautifully exhibited here in this museum, the extraordinary role that uh, Gerald Ford played as, as a leader. I, I was had the privilege of being uh, um, chairman of the Board of Foreign Scholarships, which runs the Fulbright program worldwide, and uh, uh, served during the Ford administration. So for a little bit, from a very small um, uh, window into the functioning of it, I can attest to what this museum eloquently demonstrates, and that is that this was a this was an extraordinarily steadying uh, leader who did great things for the country that I think historians appreciate now and will appreciate more in the future. In no small part, thanks to the to the leadership of uh, people here um, and this uh, fine museum, Dr. Uh, Didier and all her associates. Um, <clears throat> now this exhibit is one of the most successful that we've ever had at the Library of Congress. It uh, attracted in a fairly short period of time and under conditions where it isn't always easy to get in the Library of Congress with the building of the new visitor's center and a lot of uh, just physical obstacles it attract, attracted more than 100, well, well over 100,000 people in a relatively short space of time. Uh, it, it is a, um, uh, an exhibit that celebrates um, not only Churchill but his close association with America. I'm afraid does it something of an archaeological artifact myself. Um, I'm old enough to I'm old enough to remember those inspirational speeches. And it's very interesting. Um, if you uh, I'm even old enough to remember Fireside Chats of Roosevelt. That's what you tended to remember as radio came alive um, in the uh, uh, during that period. Uh, but the wartime speeches, it, it was the wartime speeches of Churchill that people people remember. And uh, I think one of the things you will most enjoy in this exhibit is the the key passages from some of those great and memorable speeches in the, in the videos that, that are an important part of it. Now, I think the, uh, let me say that um, since I've mentioned our online uh, activities, that this exhibit is entirely online. You could download um, uh, parts of it uh, if they appeal to you and study them more closely. Um, our, our website, which had uh, three and a half billion hits last year, we'll probably get about five billion this year, um, is uh, www.loc.gov. It's entirely free, and this exhibit and our others um, are all available there. Now, the exhibit marks two milestones. First of all, it's the first ever comprehensive exhibit on Winston Churchill ever held in the United States. Um, it's the first, second of all, it's the first exhibit to focus especially on Churchill's lifelong relationship with his country, which goes back, we found out, to 1895, his early fascination with, uh, as a schoolboy, wanting to see uh, uh, um, the uh, um, uh, sort of visiting um, rodeo show in, in London, a kind of lifelong fascination, partly as American um, half American uh, genealogy, um, but of course then his, above all, his relationship with American presidents Roosevelt, Truman, and Eisenhower. More than two-thirds of the items on display come from the rich multimedia, multi-formatted resources of the Library of Congress. Um, one of the things I think you'll enjoy is a little 
uh, not just the clips from uh, Churchill's speeches, but the clips from various actors who've portrayed Churchill. We have the largest uh, movie collection in the world, and 80% of all archival quality um, film uh, restoration ever done in this country has been done at the Library of Congress. So uh, we have uh, curators who can pick these little gems out, and I think you'll enjoy them. They're, I was listening. Um, one thing that's not in the exhibit, uh, I, I remember my early days in, in Washington, the, um, uh, you know, his famous thing, give us the tools, we'll finish the job. Uh, I remember seeing a telegram passed around in the government when they, they had, uh, in the early days of foreign aid, when they had given, had a disastrous investment in foreign aid in some third world country, and the guy sent back at them saying, give us the job and we'll finish the tools. So. <laughs> There are, there are a lot of um, uh, amusing uh, reproductions of, of, uh, of things that Churchill said that have become part of the language and the power and the beauty of English language. One of the things we learned in rehearsing this, our chief curator, a guy named Don Van, Van E, was one of the editors of the Eisenhower Papers and has deep, got deeply immersed in this. We discovered 17 unknown letters of Churchill that we had in the Library of Congress all along. Uh, including which described his experience in World War I in the trenches. Everybody knows, or most people know about his, he was active, you know, in the Battle of Gallipoli, which is one of the great disasters for the Allied course in the World Wars uh, in the Admiralty. And then he enlisted and volunteered to go into the trenches. And, but we've never really had a first-hand description uh, of that. So uh, there's a lot in this exhibit that is really um, new to, to historians, and, and Churchill has not been a neglected subject by historians. Um, so this, there was a great surprise for our curators in finding the things which comprise 70% of, of what you will see in this exhibit. Um, others, uh, some items were unknown, as I've said, even to the experts. But the exhibition also draws on the unparalleled collection of Churchill's own archive center, which is in Cambridge, England. It's the, they were our partners in the exhibit. They were wonderful to work with. Um, and um, so you're seeing a lot of Churchill letters and so forth that have never been seen. I think this is the, um, there, was, uh, there has just recently been as they open a new um, uh, war room and exhibit, uh, related exhibit in London, some of these things are being more seen, but this is the first large public viewing for a lot of these things. There's also a painting by, uh, of, by Churchill, one of his paintings that uh, Senator Warner lent us. Um, you, you will find on display everything ranging from a historic letter written by Churchill's great ancestor, the Duke of Marlborough, in 1706 to the order of service for his state funeral in 1965. Manuscripts, photographs, drawings, maps, audiovisual material, books, and one very large historic globe uh, contributed uh, to this examination of Churchill. Now, some of the items from the Churchill archives that will amuse you, an early report card in which the eight-year-old Winston is characterized as very naughty, I'm quoting it. Um, he was not a successful student. It ought to be great encouragement to every C-minus student. Uh, <laughs> to know that Churchill was a, uh, had behavioral problems and was by no means the, the best student. Um, a newly discovered letter from the library's collections uh, written shortly after Lieutenant Churchill, then 23-year-old, uh, had ridden with the last great cavalry charge in human history at the end of the 19th century. It was the 21st Lancers. It's a, it's a great, great description that we, part of the ones that we discovered in our own collections. Other newly discovered letter from our collection expressed Churchill's anguish while serving the trenches, as I've indicated, during World War I. Then you'll see the draft for his, their finest hour speech, one of the most famous speeches really in modern history. Franklin Roosevelt's handwritten plea to open a second front to draw off German pressure from the Soviets during World War II. One of the most interesting things is scribbled notes exchanged on a noisy airplane between Churchill and Roosevelt's envoy, uh, Ambassador Avril Harriman, while they were both flying in a, in a very noisy plane on a crucial and difficult mission early part of the war designed to keep Stalin into the war until the Anglo-American alliance could do its part in 
opening up a second front and stopping, stopping Hitler. It's the kind of thing that you, you, you find in archives. I'm sure that the same experience will be here and at the Ford uh, Library in, in Ann Arbor as well, that you, you discover this was, a, um, this was on the back of an envelope. They couldn't hear each other talk, and yet they had to coordinate strategy between Roosevelt and Churchill in dealing with Stalin, who wasn't, as you may uh, might have assumed the easiest person to get along with. Uh, and they, uh, so they scribble little semaphore notes to each other, and this is the kind of stuff of which history is made, but it doesn't very often, uh, often survive. Uh, the, uh, you'll see his words, both written and spoken. The exhibition opens and closes with two audiovisual stations, which feature, first of all, Churchill's own spoken words, as well as those of politicians, world leaders, entertainers, and even cartoon characters as they quote, misquote, paraphrase, and imitate one of the great craftsmen of the English language and have certainly have spoken English as well as of writing. Audio stations play these recordings of several speeches that establish his reputation um, <clears throat> as one of history's greatest orators. Um, and quotations from these famous speeches are on panels throughout the ex exhibition. Uh, we were able to realize this exhibition because of the generosity of John W. Kluge, um, who has uh, been a major benefactor to the library and who basically financed it with some additional help from the Annenberg Foundation. We are also join the, the, uh, the Ford Museum in being thankful to Steelcase for enabling the exhibit to come to Grand Rapids and to be presented here at this magnificent an historic museum. I also want to congratulate not only Elaine Didier, of whom we've already spoken, and James Kratzis, but all the ABLE staff here in mounting this exhibition. And we want to extend our deepest appreciation for, for a job well done and a sense of great satisfaction that um, this uh, exhibition of a great leader could, could come here uh, at this site that memorializes a a wonderful and memorable president of the United States. So we appreciate you all being here. We are very grateful to to uh, uh, Chairman Ehlers for his uh, championing of this uh, this location. And I must say, having been here and having having walked through and seen and the beauty of the uh, of this building and the the. Uh, the power and also the honesty and richness of the exposition of the permanent museum. I can't think of a more, more fitting place. So thank you all for being here and I hope that you will uh, visit this exhibit and be as inspired as we all were in, in putting it together and that you will also revisit and have your, your children and your grandchildren uh, uh, not only visit it but uh, make use of it and of the other things that we're putting on the internet so that the Library of Congress is not just a big 800 pound gorilla in Washington but something that gives something back to the taxpayers whose generosity through the Congress has made it possible to, to not only uh, accumulate so much of the nation's memory but to, to give it back in some small way free and with some commentary by our, our curators who I'd also like to, to mention did a, did a pretty fine job in putting this together and finding things that sometimes we didn't even know we had. We're glad to be here. We appreciate your patience and I will now sit down and prove to you that not every ex-professor always speaks for 50 minutes. So thank you all very much. In truth, in my office before coming, he asked if uh, an hour and a half talk was about the right length. And I said, oh, no, you're an academic. I know it has to be at least three. <laughs> so at any rate, we thank you. We are so honored to have Dr. Billington here. And again, want to thank Congressman Ehlers. Uh, I have uh, presents for them from the Ford Museum.